feeling Well, hello there, my lemon slices, and welcome back to the Lemonade Stand, or welcome if you are new. My name is Brianna. I'm a certified personal trainer, a big, huge biology nerd, and a registered dietitian to be. We've all assembled here today for a fun, but also a little bit disturbing video. A while back, somebody sent me the link to a fun little article published by the tabloid site, The Daily Meal, titled The Most Popular Diets of Every Decade Since 1900. And today I, a nutrition student, am going to react to it and we're gonna talk about it. Before we proceed, if you love science-based health, wellness, and fitness education with some lulls, and some dry sarcasm along the way, hit that subscribe button and join the lemonade stand. I would really love to have you here. Without further ado, let's make lemonade. Just so everyone knows, I'm not naked. I'm wearing a tube top. Specifically, I'm wearing my fruit tube top. I felt like it was fitting for today's video. Got some, I think that's a dragon fruit. That looks like a papaya. I see a pineapple, banana. I think that's a watermelon. What is that, a peach? An orange, but no lemons. It's okay, I still love this shirt. I really love any clothing with food on it. I actually got this top from Forever 21, if you could believe that. So yeah. So like I just said before, this is actually a slideshow and it was published by the website, The Daily Meal, which I would personally consider like a tabloid site, but it's not like we're discussing like super deep scientific research here. So I was like, we can look at The Daily Meal today. This is a quite an eye-opening and interesting uh, article because starting at the 1900s, they basically go through each decade and discuss the most popular fad dieting trends through each one. This article is a little bit on the older side, published in 2017. Where are we when we're saying that 2017 is old? But I figured it would still be fun to make a video reacting to it and discussing the crazy shit that people used to do and quite frankly, still continue to do sometimes all in the name of losing a few pounds. So let's dive in. So in the 1900s, there was masticating, chewing, and we're off and running. Also, just so you guys know, I'm not gonna read every single word of every single section of this article. I will pick things apart and read a few snippets here and there though. So here's a little something about what they say about masticating. In the early 1900s, Horace Fletcher, also known as the Great Masticator, advised that food, even liquids, be chewed 100 times per minute before being swallowed in order to build strength in the jaw, slow down the eating pace, improve digestion, and turn the pitiable glutton into an intelligent epicurean. Hmm. Would anyone out there care to explain to me how I'm supposed to chew a lemon drop martini? Don't worry, I'll wait. So I did a little research into this Horace Fletcher guy, and this guy, he was known as a food and health fattest. You know, like an influencer. So according to his fancy pants mastication diet, one could indulge in whatever food they desire, as long as they chewed it thoroughly enough to liquefy it before swallowing it. Gross. I guess my initial knee jerk reaction to this and like my thoughts on mastication are chew your food, you know, to avoid choking and dying, of course. But I don't think you need to chew everything to the point that it is a liquidy pulp in your mouth before you swallow it. I mean, unless it's already a liquid, right? Let's move on. Now we're in the 1910s and this is when counting calories became more popularized. It's so wild to me that counting calories was considered a fad back then because really for most people, that's what weight loss really comes down to is, um, not specifically counting calories, but like energy balance. But I guess back in this time, the concept of food having energy in the form of calories really was like a revolutionary concept. So a physician named Lulu Peters wrote a book titled Diet and Health with Key to the Calorie. And it was in this book that basically detailed like what a calorie is in its most basic form and how the food we eat basically translates into like caloric energy. Now, I don't know what exactly the book says. I have not read it, but I remember when in the, like some of the earlier classes I had to take as a dietetic student, the definition of a calorie was beat into my skull in my food science class. It seems like such a simple thing, right? But I remember being asked, what is a calorie? And I was like, oh, a calorie is, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you know what it is kind of, but you don't really know how to explain it. And you don't really fully know the actual definition of it. So let's define a calorie. A calorie is a unit of energy. A calorie is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So that's the actual like definition of a calorie. There's variance to that definition because uh, sometimes they'll say kilogram and then you use kilojoules. But that one that I just said, that is one of the basic definitions of a calorie. It's so crazy that counting calories was this like revolutionary, crazy new, hot, trendy thing because again, 
again, for most people, that's what weight loss comes down to is just energy balance. So now we move into the 1920s and now we have the cigarette diet. God damn. The Roaring Twenties was a decade of excess in that invincible Great Gatsby mentality is represented by the diet advice of the day. In 1925, Lucky Strike capitalized on tobacco's appetite suppressant qualities when they introduced the cigarette diet with the tagline, reach for a lucky instead of a sweet. So this sounds horribly unhealthy and it is but there's actually truth to it. Nicotine is a pretty powerful appetite suppressant. If you've ever been around someone who's a heavy smoker, it might seem like they're never hungry and that's probably because they're not. I have had friends in the past who are really heavy smokers and it seems like they never freaking ate. Quick story time. A few years ago, I had a friend and she had, um, she was very, very, just had a very small frame. Um, she, she would describe her body as skinny and she specifically wanted to start lifting weights and like she wanted to gain weight. She wanted to put some muscle on her frame and she just wanted to gain weight. She was very, very small. She came to the gym with me, um, I think once or twice, but something I would consistently tell her is weight gain really comes down to your diet, energy balance, eating more. I would ask her like, what do you normally eat? She would describe her diet to me and it just, it seemed like she basically lived off iced tea, no breakfast, a small lunch, a really small dinner, or like sometimes no dinner. I'm going on, this is like a eight, nine year old memory. So I am doing my best here. Or if she did have dinner, it wasn't a lot of food at all. I think we estimated her average daily calories and it came to like six to 700 calories a day or something crazy like that. And I remember I asked her seriously, like, are you intentionally not eating this much? Like, are you intentionally eating so few calories? And she was like, no, I just don't ever feel like I'm hungry. And also she was a very heavy smoker. I think at that time she was like a pack a day smoker. And I actually told her that her heavy tobacco use was probably the reason um, why she felt like she never had an appetite. Now I never pressured her and I tried not to be judgmental about it. You know, it is a personal choice. Obviously most of us see people we love smoke heavily and we want them to stop smoking. So obviously I did want her to stop smoking. But at the end of the day, it's your body and it's your choice. Like I said, that was like an eight or nine year old memory. And as far as I know, she and her husband are actually still very heavy smokers. Her husband also, I whenever we would be around him, he had a very weak appetite as well. And he also was just like a small, just a, in stature, he was just a small guy too. So they were potentially very small from their lack of eating, from their lack of appetite, which likely resulted from their heavy tobacco use. Uh, just a personal anecdotal story. Anyway, so this is crazy, yeah. Luckily this diet is not widespread anymore at all. And actually a majority of adults in the United States do not use tobacco. That's something that I just thought of. Can you even call this a diet? Because the definition of a diet, I mean, basically, is the food and drink regularly consumed. But if you're just smoking cigarettes to not eat food, that's not really a diet. <laughs> Why am I trying to rationalize this? Let's move on. Now we move on to the 1930s. Grapefruit, bananas, and skim milk. I was actually somewhat on board until I they got to skim milk. <laughs> Ew. But I personally have never been a, a milk person. I can enjoy milk if it's like, in something, like if I'm having cereal, I can have milk in my cereal. This has 2% milk in it. I can have milk when it's like in stuff, but I've never been the person to pour a glass of milk and just drink a glass of milk straight up. I think that's so gross. <laughs> It's such a weird hang up, I know. So anyway, the 1930s. By this point in history, the Great Depression had hit and everybody was having a bad time. Times were tough, food was harder to come by. According to this article, when there was food available, eating a grapefruit was believed to induce weight loss. And I actually remember uh, the whole grapefruit trend making a something of a comeback like around maybe 10 or 11 years ago. I know because I may or may not have hopped on that bandwagon. <laughs> I mean, grapefruit is a delicious fruit and it's very nutritious and very good for you. Except if you're on medication that says do not eat grapefruit, you listen to your doctor. But like pretty much all foods, it doesn't directly cause weight loss. Maybe the idea of it is like displacement in your stomach. Cause they were saying you eat it before every meal. So like if you're full with grapefruit, then you'll like eat less food. So maybe that was it. But you could accomplish that same result by just drinking water too. Hmm. So also according to this article, the banana and skim milk diet was also popularized by none other than Chiquita Banana. Interesting marketing tactic, I must say. According to this Wikipedia page, however, the diet was not invented directly by them, but it was invented by a physician named George Harrop. The diet was basically just as it sounds, just a 
a ton of bananas and skim milk every day. Apparently, uh, Dr. Harab's obese patients did lose weight, but the diet was never tested at a larger scale. It was also probably absolutely disgusting, but that's just my own opinion. I personally love bananas. They're actually my favorite fruit, but I absolutely cannot imagine eating six a day, which is what this diet called for. So I guess at a certain point, Chiquita Banana actually caught wind of this and they just took the opportunity and ran with it and just capitalized on it and just hyped it up, declaring the banana and skim milk diet to be the most popular diet of 1934. Now, this is just what I read in this Wikipedia page about the diet and like how Chiquita Banana kind of hopped on it. I wonder realistically, you know, I wasn't around in 1930. I wonder if it really was the most popular diet of 1934 or if they just said that. <laughs> Let's move on. 1940s, the wartime rationing diet. So according to the article, the wartime rationing effort limited the quantity of certain ingredients accessible to adults. One adult was allowed to have four ounces of ham, two ounces of butter, two ounces of cheese, eight ounces of sugar, and three pints of milk per week. I feel like eight ounces of sugar is a lot. Two ounces of butter is also a lot. Two ounces of cheese definitely does not sound like enough, but that's just me. It was also during this time that people were encouraged to grow their fruits and veggies too. The thing about this diet is it was born more out of necessity than trend. In the 1940s, the country was still recovering from the Great Depression. I think, I'm not a fucking historian. Then on top of that, the United States and pretty much the rest of the world too were in the throes of war. Chipotle and Starbucks were not as accessible, so people had to make do with what they had. This rationing of food was more out of the purposes of survival than it was out of trend. A difficult time indeed. All right, let's move on to the 1950s. In the 1950s, we had the prayer diet. Next up in the 1960s, we have Weight Watchers. We've all probably heard of Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers, I feel like has faced a lot of criticism, especially in more recent years. Illuminati actually made a, a really good video about them. She talked about the history and the rebrand and things like that. Um, I found it quite poignant and I recommend giving it a watch. I'll link it below. We've all probably heard of Weight Watchers. They've been around for so long that they're probably a household name at this point, especially after they got endorsed by Oprah. They've since rebranded to now calling themselves WW. Like I said, they face quite a bit of criticism in recent years, especially from like the body acceptance community. I personally am never ever going to demonize intentional weight loss. I believe there's nothing wrong with wanting to change your body, especially if it means improving your overall health and well being. but there is a right and wrong way to go about it. I don't feel like I can comment super fairly on WW though. Obviously I've heard of them. I know that there's like a point system and, and stuff like that. I've seen a couple creators talk about them. Like I said, I, I watched Illuminati's video. So I'm familiar with it, but I don't feel like I've done enough of my own individual research into them. But I've also heard some really questionable things about their methods as well. Such as at those weekly meetings, I've heard stories of people being vilified for their lack of weight loss, which is totally gross to me. Have any of you watching this ever done Weight Watchers? Did you love it or hate it? Why or why not? Chime off below. Now we arrive to the 1970s, the age of diet pills and the sleeping beauty diet. And it's from here things have officially taken an ugly turn for me. I guess I could have said that about the cigarette diet though. But was that even a diet? Pharmaceutical drugs were all the rage this time. Pop a pill, lose weight. What could possibly go wrong with that? It was during this time frame when diet pills were starting to come up on the scene. A component frequently used in the production of diet pills was the drug class amphetamines. And those often came with a lot of side effects. The primary ingredient of many diet pills of the decade was phenylpropanolamine, PPA a type of amphetamine used to treat upper respiratory problems as well as obesity. There's some typos in this. But PPA came with some side effects with the National Clearinghouse for Alcohol and Drug Information estimating 10,000 reports of phenylpropanolamine poisoning each year. In the year 2000, the US Food and Drug Administration issued a public health advisory warning of the adverse effects of PPA, which include tremors, nausea, excess sweating, chest pains, and stroke, and began the process of removing PPA from all drug products. So these drugs were a powerful appetite suppressant, which is the main mechanism for how they resulted in weight loss. Then there was the Sleeping Beauty Diet. Diet. <laughs> Participants would be sedated or force themselves to go to sleep whenever they felt hungry. More sleep was believed to lead to greater weight loss. If you think about it, it's kind of genius. If you're sleeping, you're not eating. And if you're not eating, you're losing weight. 
What I found interesting about this is that they use the word sedate. So I wonder if that means that people were actually sedated, like put under anesthesia using drugs, or if they just like pounded Benadryl. If it's the first one, I imagine that that would get very expensive because like would insurance pay for you to be medically sedated so that you can go to sleep so that you can lose weight? We're talking strictly for aesthetic reasons, not like somebody who's extremely overweight or extremely morbidly obese who would actually qualify for like weight loss uh, medical procedures. In this case, I'm talking about like a 1970s suburban housewife, but they're not like morbidly obese or extremely morbidly obese. And like they could, if they wanted to lose 10 or 15 pounds. My guess is insurance probably wouldn't cover that. Something that I actually wanna add here is I know diet pills get a bad rap and that is not for no reason. In the past, many have been proven to be very dangerous. And in people who have substance abuse issues combined with body image issues, it can be a dangerous recipe for disaster leading to addiction. I don't wanna sit here and totally bash dieting pills though. The fact is pharmaceutical weight loss drugs have come a long way. Obviously no pharmaceutical drug out there is without side effects. That's just a fact. But overall, they're much safer now than they were 70 years ago. And on a related note, I personally, I hate when people bash and shame people who have used pharmaceutical interventions for their weight loss journey. You don't know what that person has tried or discussed with their healthcare team. Sometimes drugs are just the best option for people. And as long as they've obtained informed consent and are under medical supervision, I personally don't think that there's anything wrong with that. We see that a lot, like when health and wellness gurus shame people who use drugs to treat mental health conditions such as uh, depression. That might be the best option for someone. And if it's working for them, if they're safe and happy and healthier, why are you shaming them? Oh, right, because big pharma is bad, right? So next up in the 1980s, we have the Scarsdale diet. If you're wondering why they have a picture of former President Ronald Reagan here, don't worry, I wondered that too. <laughs> According to the article, the 1980s marked a time of political conservatism, and that included diet. The Scarsdale diet created by Dr. Herman Tarnauer advocated for a two week high protein, low carb and low calorie diet. Participants would spend two weeks on the diet followed by two weeks off and were instructed to consume fewer than a thousand calories per day. Um, okay, so I think it's glaringly obvious why this resulted in weight loss. <laughs> Most adults who eat under a thousand calories a day are going to lose a staggering amount of weight. Also, I did some light digging into the physician who developed this diet, Dr. Tarnauer, and I could not for the life of me figure out why this diet was called the Scarsdale diet. <laughs> when I first heard it, I assumed that that was the name of the person who developed it, right? But obviously not. So I don't know. I'm sure I could find out why it was called the Scarsdale diet, but I just chose to not dig that much deeper into it. For this video, I wanted it to be more of a surface level, a knee jerk reaction to what I was reading here. Maybe I'll Google it after I'm done filming this video. Under this uh, section of the article, they also noted that though this diet did result in weight loss for most, it also probably caused a lot of nutrient deficiencies, which is not surprising at all. I'm having flashbacks of Optivia. And now we've arrived to the 1990s, the glorious 90s. What a decade that was. A lot of great things happened in the 90s. I was born. That's pretty much it. The Atkins diet was all the rage then. You know, all the meat, cheese, and lard you could possibly want. This diet was created by Dr. Robert Atkins. Finally, a diet that was named after the developer. <laughs> the goal of a severely low carb diet is to move the body into a state of ketosis, a process that forces the body to convert stored fat for energy rather than stored glucose. However, there is little conclusive evidence that a diet absent of carbohydrates is any more effective than a well-balanced diet that includes a whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and other complex carbohydrates. You don't say. Well, I never thought I would agree with the tabloid site. If you've never heard of the Atkins diet, it's very reminiscent of the keto diet that we've all probably heard of today. Or should I say the keto diet is very reminiscent of the Atkins diet. It was probably during this time that people started just straight demonizing carbs and sugar. Carbs are fattening. Carbs make you fat. Blah, 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 blah. False. Carbohydrates are not inherently fattening. They are no more fattening beyond their caloric value than any other macronutrient. Sugar does not make you fat. Should you moderate the amount of sugar you eat on a daily basis? Of course you should if you wanna be a healthy human. But also for most of us, the occasional sugary treat can fit into a healthy, well-balanced diet. Sugar does not make 
you fat. And finally, we widen to reveal the 2000s and beyond. Paleo, gluten-free, and the baby food diet. This section lists diets we've probably all heard of. Paleo, gluten-free, and baby food. I've definitely heard of all of these, but the baby food diet never ceases to intrigue me. <laughs> diets post Y2K represent a general sense of confusion regarding nutrition and weight loss, and the public has shown a willingness to try just about anything, from a diet focused solely on Twinkies to one that's founded on eating only baby food. It's impossible to talk about contemporary diets without mentioning the growing fear of gluten that has birthed an industry dedicated to avoiding all things wheat and the paleo diet whose practitioners are convinced that eating like our paleolithic ancestors is the key to health and weight loss. This is this article, they only go up to the early 2000s and a little bit beyond. But as we all know, since then, many, many more diet trends have been born. I personally blame influencers. Trendy gut health diets, fasting of all kinds, container systems, breatharians, people who are not diabetic and overall healthy using CGMs or continuous glucose monitors, which continues to infuriate me. Diets these days are just all over the shop. I think diet trends over the decades demonstrate two things. One, how desperate so many people are to lose weight. And two, the lack of basic understanding and literacy surrounding food science and just healthy dietary habits. A lot of people just don't know any better. And a lot of us, especially in this day and age, get our information from social media, which in my opinion is not inherently a bad thing. Social media can be a wealth of great information, but unfortunately, I think too often the accurate and evidence-based information often gets overshadowed by the nonsense and bullshittery that health influencers love to spread. After I was done reading this article, something else that I noticed about all the diets here that had like a specific uh, developer, inventor, if you will, were developed by doctors. I've said this before, Doctors are not nutrition professionals, they are medical professionals. And honestly, it really shows when they're creating the diet, telling the average lay person to eat a thousand calories a day. People sometimes get mad at me when I say that, and I really don't understand why. It's true. Doctors are not nutrition professionals, the same way registered dietitians are not medical professionals. The same way an automotive mechanic is not a chef. Everybody has a scope of practice, and it's important, especially in the world of healthcare, that everybody stays in their scope of practice. In fact, the only physician here that got it remotely correct was Dr. Lulu Peters, who introduced the concept of just counting calories. Because again, that's really what weight loss comes down to for most humans. Earlier in history was a time when nutrition science was really in its infancy and people didn't understand a whole lot about it. On top of that, doctors were often seen as, even now, they were seen as universally right about everything just because they're a doctor. And the few nutrition professionals that were around during these times were not taken as seriously because they weren't a doctor. So if this were the 1990s and you wanted to lose some weight, you may not have ever heard of a registered dietitian before. You're at the doctor's office and you say to your physician, hey, I wanna lose a few pounds. And they tell you, oh, go do the Atkins diet. If you were to encounter a dietitian around that time and a dietitian said to you, you know, you don't really need to do Atkins and that might not be a good idea for you. Because of the time period and because you don't even really know what a dietitian is, you might not feel so inclined to listen to them. You'd probably be more inclined to listen to your doctor, right? I wonder if CNSs were around during this time. Anybody watching this, were you were you a certified nutrition specialist during any of the decades that we talked about during this time? Were those around? I'm genuinely curious. If they were, I bet they had the same plight as dietitians. They're just here trying to teach people to drink water, eat vegetables, and practice moderation, but then they have to compete with doctors telling people to eat a thousand calories a day or only eat bacon and eggs. <laughs> Something I also want to take the time to add here is I don't want it to come off as if I'm knocking any medical profession. When I actually started college as an undergraduate biology student at EC, you, I wanted to be a doctor. I was actually pre-med and I actually specifically, um, I was really interested in neurology and I actually wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I've always been interested in human biology and just biomedical science and medical science and bodies and things like that. So it was really my love of uh, human biology that drove me to want to pursue medicine. That's what I used to want to do. And then, you know, you're in college. The same thing that happened to me happens to everybody when you're in college. Your interest changes, your passion shifts. And at some point I decided I didn't want to go to medical school anymore. And I actually became more interested in food science. So yeah, <laughs> the rest is history. Here we are. Sometimes my parents will still ask me, hey, why don't you go to medical school? <laughs> like, it's just an easy thing to do. <laughs> it's just not where my heart is. And I think you have to be like all in it. Here's something interesting about me. If I were to ever go to medical, school, I would actually go to study forensic pathology because I'd want to be a medical examiner. I know that's so creepy and gross and weird, but I think forensic pathology is fascinating. I'm also, I never ever talk about it, but I'm a total 
total true crime junkie. I can probably name more serial killers than I can people I know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, really fascinating. If you're a physician or if you're in medical school or if you're a nurse or a nursing school, what are you studying? What do you specialize in? Chime off below, I wanna hear about it. So that was fun. I don't know why it took me so long to do this video. I think at a certain point I got distracted by uh, my anti MLM theme stuff. So anyway, yeah, that was, that was a fun video. I would actually react to more articles like that. If you guys can find stuff, um, send it to me, please. I recommend sending it in my email though, easier to reach me in my email, so yeah. This was a very interesting article for me to read and honestly, I quite enjoyed it, I learned a lot. If you made it to this point, thank you so very much for watching, I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. If you enjoyed me and wanna see more, hit the subscribe button, why not? Enjoy the lemonade stand, become a lemon drop. Or if you dislike me, you can also dislike the video, that's fine too. Uh, and if you did hate me, I guess thanks for watching until the end. She must know when I'm, when I'm like wrapping up filming. You just wanna be on camera. Thank you again so very much for watching. Like, subscribe, follow me on Instagram, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. You know, your timing was suspiciously correct coming in here. Onyx, stop it. That's gross. Onyx was always uh, trying to go in to lick her ears. We actually think right now, we think she has, uh, we think she's got a yeast infection in her ears. Um, so uh, she's actually going to the vet on Thursday in two days so that we can get that checked out. Poor little baby, her ears have been so itchy. Heaven day baby. And it really doesn't help that Onyx likes to lick ears too. I'm pretty sure that's one thing that's contributed. If she has a yeast infection or some kind of uh, bacterial infection as it might also be, I'm pretty sure Onyx licking her ears has uh, contributed to that too. Or it hasn't, at the very least, I know it doesn't help. So if we catch him licking her ears, we always stop him. She likes it though. She's a little weirdo. There he goes, he's always licking her. Onyx. There he goes, licking her face. She likes it, look at you. You like it. You shut up, baby. Say bye, baby.